Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 443rd episode, we're talking all about dinosaurs on islands. We ended up changing directions. We were going to talk about the dinosauroid Mm -hmm. this week, but we're going to do that later. Yes, well, Prehistoric Planet 2 just came out, and we were lucky enough to be able to get some really great interviews, and we're able to watch the episodes a little bit early, so we decided, hey, why not make a few episodes around Prehistoric Planet, because we love the show and the science behind it, and of course, the dinosaurs are beautiful. Yeah, so we have dinosaurs of the day related to Prehistoric Planet, but also the themes are based on different ecosystems. So the first episode of season two is about islands. And we don't talk a lot about islands in general on the show, so I thought it'd be kind of fun to do that and then dive into some of the specific island dinosaurs that they talk about on the show. And one of those is Morosaurus, which is our dinosaur of the day. A surprising one, which I'll get into when we get to the dinosaur (laughs) of the day. But before we get into all of that, we have some patrons we'd like to thank. And this week we have one new patron, and that's Reggie. Thank you very much for joining. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Talon, Elrex, Remy Rodriguez, it's Devin Baby, Planner Sir Oliphus, Trev, Ermel, Scott, and Gabe. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a die know it all and being part of our community. I know we say this a lot, but we really couldn't keep this show going without our patrons. So getting into uh, dinosaurs on islands, one question you might have is, how do dinosaurs end up on islands? And why were there islands in the Mesozoic in the middle of what are now continents? Yeah, like how Europe was just a series of islands in the Cretaceous. So it's pretty strange, especially because usually when we think of paleocontinents, People think of Pangaea when all the continents were combined and it was very arid. You don't think of a lot of moisture in that environment. Or if you're a little more knowledgeable, you might think about Gondwana in the southern hemisphere and Laurasia to its north, but still supercontinents, not a lot of ocean in between the land masses. Mm -hmm. But depending on the time period, there actually were a lot of islands in the Mesozoic. And this is especially true in the late Cretaceous. By that point, the Continents had broken up, and sea levels were also very high, which meant that the oceans could fill in a lot of the low-lying areas around the different continent coasts, and also pretty far inland in some places. And that meant that a lot of the hills and plateaus on the continents suddenly became islands because all the low areas were covered in sea. Well, maybe not suddenly, suddenly, but yeah. (laughs) Suddenly in geological times, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So yeah, Europe was split into many islands. There were also islands in the Americas, Africa, Asia, India, Antarctica, and Australia. Basically, all the continents had islands that aren't islands today. And there were also islands that are islands today, like Madagascar. True, yeah. And some islands like India became part of (laughs) a different continent. Mm -hmm. So the Geological Society of London had a special publication back in 2019 by Michael Wagereich et al., and they were addressing the question of why sea level was so high in the Cretaceous. And it was actually a huge project by UNESCO and the International Union of Geological Science. They spent six years with over 150 scientists working on it. And the reason it's worth figuring out and putting so much effort into it is because it's a problem we're dealing with today. Obviously, with global warming and sea levels rising, They were hoping to learn from the past to see what caused it in the Cretaceous, what the impact was of these different effects on the sea level, and then, you know, hopefully we can apply that to today. So they found that there were both short-term and long-term causes of sea level rise in the Cretaceous. In the short term, we're talking about tens of thousands of years to millions of years. (laughs) Short in geological time. Yeah. And I mean, there might have been some of these things that w- could affect in just a year or even 10 years, but you would never see that in the in the fossil record. So the, the smallest order of magnitude you can get down to is about 10,000 years when you're talking about Cretaceous stuff. What they found was that temperature is a pretty big factor 
Water expands when it's warmer, and you can get up to about 10 meters or 30 feet of sea level rise just from an increasing temperature. This is the one that I'm always thinking about today with global warming, is just that thermal expansion of the water. Mm. That just got me thinking of how in the summertime when it's hot, my fingers expand. So if you're wearing a ring, for example, it might feel a little bit tighter. <laughs> that can happen, yeah. Because of that water expansion. <laughs> I think that's more of a biological <laughs> system. But yeah, almost everything does expand when it's warmer. They also found that continental sea ice can obviously change sea level. So sea level drops when water is trapped on ice above land. Ice in the water doesn't affect sea level. So for example, the ice on Greenland and Antarctica help to lower sea level, but the ice that's at the North Pole, which is just floating in the Arctic Ocean, doesn't do anything for sea level because it just displaces the water and it doesn't make a difference whether it's ice or not. Continental ice is estimated to have up to 120 meters or about 400 feet of sea level change when <laughs> it's all trapped up in Greenland and Antarctica. But that's probably not very relevant for the Cretaceous since we don't think there was much, if any, continental ice back then. Hmm. More significant for the Cretaceous is groundwater and lakes, it turns out, which was really surprising to me. What they said was, quote, stronger humid conditions result in higher storage in groundwater reservoirs and higher lake levels, thus filling up the continental aquifers as discharge into the oceans cannot keep up. This lowers sea level, end quote. Interesting. Yeah, so if you've ever dug a well or used water from a well, you know that beneath the ground, there is tons of water, even on the continent. But when it's really dry out, you have to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And you see that in desert environments and stuff. The wells are a lot deeper than in somewhere where you're right by the coast or where there's a really high water table and things are more moist. It turns out that with this water trapped up on the continents, that reduces the sea level. But when it gets drier and more arid, groundwater and lakes dry out and then that water gets added to the oceans because it has to go somewhere. It's always somewhere on the crust of the earth. It's either in the oceans or it's on the continents, but it's somewhere. It's a really slow process, this change from groundwater and lake water to the oceans or vice versa. It's on the order of about half a millimeter per year of sea level rise or less, but it can continue for tens of thousands of years and they estimate that it can reach nearly 100 meters or 300 feet of sea level rise if things completely dry out, hmm. which is huge. That is. That's almost as much as you get from the continental ice, which was pretty surprising to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the short-term ways that sea level can change. In the longer term, meaning millions of years and up, there are more causes of sea level rise, one of them is when continents collide, they basically pile up on top of each other, leaving more area for the oceans to fill so that sea level has more space to spread out and therefore it has to drop a little bit as it's spreading more of the area. Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. They estimate that that can cause a drop of up to about 10 meters or 30 feet over millions of years. So it's similar to the amount that you get by heat expansion. You can also get sea level rise from sedimentation. So sediment can slowly run off continents into the ocean or form in the ocean itself as carbonates displacing water and things like coral reefs and increasing sea level on the order of up to about 100 meters or 300 feet over millions of years. So continents have quite an impact in the long term. Yeah, yeah. Whether that it's a lot of it boils down to is there something in the ocean area displacing water towards the land or is it all piled up on the land mm -hmm. and then there's more space in the ocean for the water to spread out but the biggest impact the researchers found was that seafloor spreading and ocean floor volcanism really can increase sea levels so there are huge mountain ranges that fill the middle of oceans and displace ocean water mm -hmm. over millions of years they can displace hundreds of meters, nearly a thousand feet of water in sea level rise terms. Wow. This was probably the major driving force of ocean level rise in the late Cretaceous, because as we know, that's when Africa and South America were separating. There was a lot of ocean building happening <laughs> in the late Cretaceous. And as a result, there were these huge underwater mountains 
forming and each mountain that forms has to displace a mountain worth away Mm -hmm. from the ocean. Things have to go somewhere. Yeah. The estimates in total, combining the short-term and the long-term impacts from the Cretaceous, were that roughly 170 to 250 meters or 550 to 820 feet of sea level rise occurred at some points in the Cretaceous. And for the record, more than half of humanity lives below this elevation, so that would be a big problem if that happened today. Yes. For comparison, today about 29% of Earth is covered by land, but at the sea level peak in the Cretaceous, only about 18% of Earth was covered by land. That's how you end up with so many islands. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, there were islands all over the place, including places today that are pretty far inland. And that also means that a lot of dinosaurs ended up being isolated on these newly formed islands. And then evolution did its thing and you get some really interesting results. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we've talked about how some titanosaurs in South America were smaller when they got isolated on Patagonian islands. And obviously, Hateg Island, you talked all about in episode 400, Mm -hmm. which was an island, but it's now just part of Romania. Mm -hmm. And it's very weird to think of Romania as being an island (laughs) since it's surrounded by other countries. There's only a a little bit of seashore that it has. But that's what happens when hundreds of feet of sea level rise come up. Yes. And we'll be focusing on the dinosaurs and the islands in Prehistoric Planet 2, so just Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched it yet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The nice thing about Prehistoric Planet is it's not anything you wouldn't really, I mean, it's predatory dinosaurs chasing herbivorous dinosaurs, sometimes other predatory dinosaurs and things. There's some playful moments. There are some surprises, but it's not like a a whole story arc where you're going to be like, oh no, we know who gets caught in the end or something. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, definitely recommend watching Prehistoric Planet. If you can. Mm -hmm. First, I wanted to share some VFX stats about Prehistoric Planet 2 because it was impressive to me. Season 2 took three years to make, which must mean there was some overlap between Season 1 and Season 2. It does, doesn't it? They built for Season 2 58 prehistoric animals, so new ones, that included dinosaurs, pterosaurs, marine reptiles, crocodilomorphs, mammals, and more. And they built them kind of bone up cuz you know you have the bones then the, you have the muscles then the skin then scales fur feathers teeth whatever details you need yeah and then the dirt and dust and everything on top of that to make them look like they're really in the environment yes there was a uh, 1183 vfx shots and at the peak more than 300 artists were working on prehistoric planet 2 so it just gives you an idea of the enormity of this project <laughs> Yeah, it's huge. And like we said, episode one for season two is all about islands. The three main islands are Hatseg, Madagascar, and Antarctica. And like Garrett mentioned, we have talked in depth about Hatseg Island in episode 400, so we won't get too much into it here. But I did want to talk about the formations for Madagascar and Antarctica. So on Madagascar, we've got the Mavarano Formation, It's in northwestern Madagascar, and at the time, it would have been a seasonal environment with rainy and dry seasons, and it was semi-arid, and there were rivers. This is in the late Cretaceous. This formation was first explored in 1895 by French military physician Dr. Félix Salette and his staff. They sent fossils and information to Charles Depere, who named two dinosaurs from that formation, Titanosaurus madagascariensis, which is now a nomum dubium, with some of its fossils have been reassigned to a different sauropod, Rapetosaurus, and Megalosaurus crenatissimus, which is no longer known as Megalosaurus, as we've talked about, Megalosaurus is a wastebasket, or mm-hmm. has in the past been a wastebasket taxon, so now those fossils are known as Majungasaurus. It's a good one. It is. There's a lot of animals that have been found in this formation. There's frogs, including the devil frog. Buffo, turtles, snakes, lizards, mammals, multiple crocodiliforms. Apparently they were abundant at the time. Also fish. And in terms of dinosaurs, we've got Majungasaurus. There's Mashikasaurus. And we've covered Majungasaurus back in episode 124. And Mashikasaurus in 127, if you want to learn more about 
those specific dinosaurs. There's also Rapetosaurus, multiple specimens found. And we covered that in episode 311. <laughs> Are you going to list every episode? <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to know details. You did put a lot of work into those dinosaurs <laughs> of the day, I know. <laughs> Thank you. There's Vahini. That's a titanosaur we haven't covered yet, but it was named in 2014. And the genus name means traveler in Malagasy, and it's known from a partial brain case. There's also an ankylosaur that we know of based on teeth. We used to think it was Stegosaurus, then we thought it was Majungasaurus, then a Hadrosaur or a Crocodilian. Now we think it's an ankylosaur. <laughs> That's hard when all you have is teeth. Yes. And then as for the more bird-like dinosaurs, there's the an Antiornithine Falcotacli. There's the Paravian Rahonavis, and the Ornithormorph Verona. Yeah, that Falcotacli one is really crazy. Like It looks just like a toucan. But with teeth and a different tail. <laughs> I know, it's so crazy. That be, could be a fun dinosaur of the day at some point. It could be. We'll see. Oh, am, am I on to something? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the other island on Antarctica, we've got the Snow Hill Island Formation, and that's on James Ross Island in Antarctica. I couldn't find as much information on this one. Maybe that makes sense. It's probably a little bit harder to get to. Yes. <laughs> there were a lot of animals that lived there, though, including plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, ammonites, fish, bivalves. And as for the dinosaurs, there's imperobotter. Yeah, I think we usually say imperobotor, but then in Prehistoric Planet, they were saying it more like imperobotter or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it appears in the. In the first episode there. Then there's Morosaurus, which is our dinosaur of the day. Also appears in episode one of Prehistoric Planet 2. There's Trinosaura, which has a lot of similarities to Morosaurus. There's Antarctopelta, an ankylosaur. Oh, they could have put in an Antarctopelta and they didn't. <laughs> Although that might have been in the first season, actually. I think it might have been. Mm, sounds familiar. There's an indeterminate Iguanodontid. And... An ornithopod informally named Biscoviosaurus, but that might be Morosaurus. It's unclear. You know, not enough overlapping material to know for sure. And then there's Antarctic avis, a type of bird. Yeah, I think one of the things people talk about with James Ross Island, too, is that it was pretty far south even back then. So it probably was fairly cold. And the dinosaurs probably had to deal with periods of time without much vegetation, mm -hmm. which would have been hard for the herbivores. And then obviously if the herbivores are hibernating or something, that means it's harder for the carnivores too, because yep. what are they going to hunt? Can't hunt ice. <laughs> I, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> so next we'll talk about the filming locations for episode one. But before we do that, we'll take a quick sponsor break. Now, I want to talk about the filming locations for episode one of Prehistoric Planet 2 and the animals associated with them. There were a lot of filming locations for all the episodes. Yeah. So, again, spoilers because this is going to kind of break down filming locations by the scenes in the episode. The episode starts off and you see a Zelmoxis on a raft. Well, actually, you see a a little baby pterosaur, but then you see a Zelmoxis on a raft. A really tiny raft. <laughs> yes, a very tiny raft, and it actually needs to swim. It needs to jump off the raft and swim to escape a Mosasaur, Pronathodon. I don't know if I should give away whether or not it makes it. <laughs> you can give it away. <laughs> okay, it does, and it finds a friend. <laughs> Yay! Okay. <laughs> For this scene... There were a number of locations. There was Wells Next to the Sea in Norfolk, England, which is a seaport town. They went also to Hardingham Lake in Norfolk, England. Cromwell Quarry in South Gloucestershire in the UK. It's a diving center. And Noah's Creek in Queensland, Australia, which is a World Heritage Reserve in Daintree Rainforest. So they went from the UK all the way to Australia for one scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just really quickly... Pronathodon, that's a mosasaur. It's heavily built. It's got thick pointed teeth and it could crush shells and rip apart flesh. And according to the people at Prehistoric Planet, it was, quote, essentially the killer whale of its day. <laughs> that's interesting because that is what I was thinking when I was swimming towards the little raft. It reminded me of those 
killer whales trying to wash seals off of sea ice by like making a wave <laughs> come at the raft. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then, like I said, it went after the Zelmoxies. Zelmoxies made it. And Zelmoxies was our dinosaur of the day in last week's episode, 442. So get all the details there. Then, like I mentioned, we also see a baby pterosaur. That's an Alcyone, I think is how it's pronounced. And it's just cute and fuzzy. Yeah, they didn't actually name that one in the episode, but they officially did announce that. Yes. So since there isn't really a sense of scale in that scene, I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about the exact size of these animals. So you might remember from last week, Zelmoxies, depending on the species, were about 2 to 2.9 meters long, or about 6.5 to 9.5 feet long, and they were probably under a meter or 3 feet tall, which basically means it's like the size of a big bipedal dog, if there were bipedal dogs, <laughs> <laughs> with a really long tail. See so how you could imagine Zalmoxies. And it's a plant eater with a, like a beaky mouth, too, if, if you didn't see it in the show. The Mosasaur pronathodon that was coming after it was one of the biggest Mosasaurs. Its skull alone was 1.4 meters or almost five feet long, which means that it could fit most of Zalmoxies in its mouth pretty easily. It'd be a snack. Yeah, I think so. And for the record, the total size of Pronathodon was over 10 meters or 33 feet long, which is about twice the size of a large great white shark. And that Zalmoxies was very right to be afraid mm -hmm. and trying to get away as quickly as possible. It's also extremely lucky that male Zalmoxies found a female Zalmoxies and ended up on a natural raft together. A bigger raft. <laughs> yeah, huge raft. It's possible they could establish a new species. We saw this proposed with the first hadrosaurid found in Africa that was described back in 2020. It's named Ajnabia Odysseus, and Ajnabi is Arabic for foreigner, and Odysseus obviously, quote, after the mythical voyager, end quote. Went on a long journey. Yeah, so they were basically imagining a long journey in this sort of way, you know, something like prehistoric planet where it's either on a raft, just like Odysseus, <laughs> going across the Mediterranean Sea, or otherwise it just had to walk a really circuitous route or maybe swim or got swept out to sea or who knows what. But in this case, we've got a rhabdodontid instead of a hadrosaurid, although they're both ornithopods, so they're pretty similar. Yeah. Jumping over to Hatzeg Island. There's a scene where Hatsagopteryx is hunting Tethys hadros, and it goes after the babies. It's giant and terrifying at being an Ashdarkid. <laughs> yeah. They really conveyed the sense of like dread that you'd have as this little dinosaur pleasantly eating in a field, and then like it's almost like military aircraft or something coming from overhead or like mm. star wars you know like tie fighters or something coming in <laughs> yeah although the tethys hadros just wanted to talk about real quick the was it serrated beak kind of mm -hmm. looked like a mustache it really did look like a mustache yeah yeah anyway it, they go after the babies because a lot of times you end up hunting babies yeah apparently that was kind of a theme throughout prehistoric planet yes and, you know, unfortunately, not all the babies got away. Yeah. And as we know, Hatsagopteryx is the apex predator of Hatseg Island. We talked about that in episode 400. And Tethys Hadros, we covered it in episode 77. That was a while back. They filmed this scene in Tetford Forest, Norfolk in the UK. It's the largest lowland pine forest in Britain. And yeah, it was really cool. Like, the pine forest was kind of a barrier mm -hmm. for hot psychiatrics. Yeah, it was like they were hiding inside something, but they were just inside the forest. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was too tricky for the huge giraffe-sized hot psychiatrics. In the show, they mentioned that Tethys Hadros is about as tall as a human. <laughs> <laughs> really brings it all into perspective when you're watching, then you're like, oh no, that could be a human trying to get away from this giant predator. Yeah. Although in the show, they didn't go after the adults because the, the babies were easier pickings. I think the adults, especially if it was a more desperate situation or if there weren't babies around that were easier pickings, certainly could have been on the menu. Mm -hmm. I always think of those hot psychopteryx now as like a flying murder giraffe. 
<laughs> with, I don't know, like a, a giraffe with a spear for a head. Like that's how they're often described as. It's because the neck is so long. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a picture of a giraffe the other day and I thought, oh, what if that was a predator? Yeah, I do too. Now when I see a giraffe, I imagine the giant beak mm -hmm. of an Ashtar kid on it. But even though Tethys Hadros was about the same height as a human, it was much bigger than a person by weight. The estimate for Tethys Hadros is roughly half a ton. Yeah, that is a lot so, heavier. Yeah, a human would be much easier of a meal for Hatsigopteryx. And they did a little behind the scenes with Mark Witten where he pointed out that the neck is about as wide as a man's shoulders. <laughs> so it kind of tells you that maybe Hatsigopteryx could swallow some of us whole. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, definitely not an animal you want to mess with. It's a good thing they hid in the forest. The next island is Madagascar. It's a big island. It is a big island. So there's a lot of animals there. And there's a lot going on. They filmed it in the lower Zambezi National Park in Zambia, which is known for its wildlife, which I'll share a little bit later. That wasn't great for this <laughs> <laughs> filming. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I always imagine when you're filming something, you want it like a soundstage. You know, you don't want anything else making noise. You don't want anything else distracting you. So a lot of wildlife around isn't really ideal. Well, it depends because usually if you're doing a nature documentary, you're there to film the nature. Oh, that's true. Yes. Yeah. That's sort of the one exception. Yes. <laughs> Except when you're doing a nature documentary about the Cretaceous and you don't want a bunch of modern, modern animals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there were some dinosaurs in these scenes, but there were also mammals and snakes and crocodile forms. I'll start with the mammal. They had a dolotherium, which is large, large for the time and heavily built. It was named in 2020, so they kind of had to rush create this mammal for the show mm -hmm. it's similar in size for a badger so again big for its time and it had a broad head and a short snout it ate tough plants it had good hearing and it was a burrower in the show we see a mother taking care of her young in a burrow yeah i also saw some estimates that it might have been like a possum sized mm. but badger shaped but yeah and oh as a vfx side note they made three million hairs for all these mammals. Wow. <laughs> for the mother and the babies. Anyway, then we got a giant python-like snake, Matsoya. It's up to 26 feet or 8 meters long. Now, it looked like a python, but it wasn't closely related. It probably also hid in burrows. And in the show, it surprise attacks a Mashikasaurus. Yeah. Because just because you're a dinosaur doesn't mean you're automatically protected from other animals. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah, I saw that Mad Soya, the first specimen they found in Madagascar, was estimated at about five meters, which is under 20 feet. But later they found a much longer individual, or at least some bones from a much longer individual that, yeah, they estimated that eight meter, 26 foot length. And I think that's about the size of the Mad Soya in prehistoric planet. Mm -hmm. It definitely looked longer than five meters. And that makes it bigger than any snake alive today, including the anaconda and the reticulated python. Ooh. Although it is much smaller than Titanoboa, which is sort of a famous paleontology specimen of snakes, mm -hmm. which fortunately for dinosaurs wasn't around until after the Mesozoic. But Titanoboa reached lengths of over 12 meters or 40 feet. So it's like as long as a T-Rex. <laughs> and it weighed about a ton. I'm glad that's not still around. That could have really taken down some large dinosaurs if they had coexisted. Mm-hmm. Could have taken down some people. Going back to Mashikasaurus, we covered that one in episode 127. And it's kind of known for its interesting teeth because it's a theropod, but its front teeth were projecting forward instead of straight down. Yeah, we've got an interview coming up with Darren Nash. A little hint at mm -hmm. what's to come in future episodes. He's the consultant for Prehistoric Planet. Yep, the paleontologist. And I didn't recognize the Mashikasaurus at first in the Prehistoric Planet because they reconstructed it with the teeth in a more normal position. So the top teeth point down and the bottom teeth point up. Rather than usually, the jaws of Mashikasaurus are reconstructed in a pretty dramatic curve, sort of pointing out at the front of the mouth. The teeth are coming out? Yes. Mm -hmm. It reminds me kind of of a sand tiger shark, if you've ever seen those. It's just sort of like crazy teeth pointing out all over the place. And it looks almost like it's 
using its teeth as like an extra snatching ability or like, you know, kind of like chopsticks or something sticking out of the front of its mouth a little bit. But the Mashigasaurus and Prehistoric Planet doesn't have them quite as dramatic. And on top of that, all the theropods in Prehistoric Planet have lips, so you can't see the teeth as much. Mm -hmm. So it sort of camouflages that it's Mashikasaurus. And I, I don't think I would have recognized it if they didn't call it out. Yeah, same. Actually, in a later, a later episode, we go back to Madagascar, and I think it's a baby Mashikasaurus. And it took us a long time to figure out that was Mashikasaurus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you figured it out before me. I was like, it must be an ornithopod. It looks like an ornithopod mm -hmm. to me. <laughs> and then Darren confirmed for us, so that's good. Mm -hmm. There's also Simosuchus, which the thinking is this one might become a fan favorite because it's pretty cute. It's a pug croc. It's a crocodiliform, and it's got a short, broad face. That's why it's a pug croc. That's the nickname, pug and, croc. It's not yes. like an official scientific term. <laughs> oh, true, true. And it's got teeth meant to eat leaves, so it's an herbivore. It was heavily armored, it had powerful legs, it may have used burrows, and in the show, those burrows help it to escape and attack. Yeah, it is a cute one. Yeah, you're really rooting for that one. It's being attacked by Majungasaurus. We covered Majungasaurus, I said, back in 124 episode. Majungasaurus is the top predator in the ecosystem, and we've talked about it before, there's evidence that it was sometimes a cannibal. It has this blunt spike or horn on its head and very short arms. Like I'm kind of surprised we didn't see it belly flop while it's running <laughs> around. Yeah, they didn't show the display like they did with Carnotaurus and its little like blue arms in the first season. <laughs> yeah, and actually now that I think about it, because it's going after the Simosuchus, which is in the burrows, and it kind of tries to get at it in the burrow, like puts its mouth in there. But how does it get out with no arms? Or with hardly any arms. <laughs> I wouldn't have to use its legs, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of surprised because Majungasaurus is a well-documented cannibal that they didn't use that at all in the episode. Although, after talking to Darren, he pointed out that it's a family show. So I can kind of understand why they didn't go the cannibalism route. Mm -hmm. And also big predators chewing on each other, potentially on other carcasses and stuff might not be the brand that they're going for. Yeah. Or who knows? Maybe if there's more prehistoric planet seasons, <laughs> they could explore that. It's true. You want to leave something for the future. So I mentioned before that filming in that national park wasn't necessarily the easiest. And that's because it's home to a lot of lions and a lot of elephants. <laughs> Jeez. And while they were filming, this is according to assistant producer Rebecca Bangay, quote, the presence of these magnificent animals was a challenge, not a bonus. <laughs> 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 because they didn't want any of the animals in the shots. They're just trying to get the environment so that they can put the CGI animals in. Mm -hmm. And apparently elephants often photobomb them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're so big that even if they're way off in the distance, I could see the elephants being a problem. Well, this is a really fun quote from Rebecca. Quote, the most memorable of these visits was from an elephant mother and calf. Just a few feet from our trucks, the mother dug a deep hole in the dry riverbed to reach the water below, tenderly providing her calf with a much needed drink. It was behavior Paul Stewart, a highly experienced wildlife cameraman, once spent weeks searching for to film, and yet here he could only watch, beguiled but frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I could at least capture it with my iPhone. Paul was gutted that his camera was out of reach, ready for the next plate shot. It would be the perfect backdrop for our Madagascan prehistoric animals, but necessarily clear of the wonderful wildlife that surrounded us on location. <laughs> 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 that's really funny that's just how animals are right you try to get them to do something or find something for weeks and then when you least want it that's yep. when they do it <laughs> and you're not even able to get it on camera yourself for later mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a really cool thing i didn't know elephants did that dug water holes for their young yeah it's very cute yeah i'm sure that was a, a nice moment to watch okay now we're moving on to the antarctica scenes or Antarctic scenes. James Ross Island. Yes. They had a lot of filming locations for these. There was Abraham Lake in Alberta, Canada, which is an artificial lake and Alberta's largest reservoir. The Alvey and Dalrati Estate in Scotland in the UK, and that's a secluded highland estate. And the Callahan Valley and Squamish 
Leowit in British Columbia, Canada, which is home of the 2010 Winter Olympics Whistler Olympic Park. So they did Canada and Scotland. For, yes. Those are cold places. Yeah. Might be similar today to how Antarctica was back then. So these are the locations for Imperobatar and Morosaurus. And Imperobatar was named in 2019. We don't know much about this dinosaur. We covered it as a news item back in our episode 232, and we only know a partial foot. But it's a paravian. You know that from the foot. So based on that, we're thinking it's got the long tail and feathers, and it's about in prehistoric planet four to five meters long or 13 to 16-ish feet. Yeah, yeah, it's cool because paravian is more bird-like than what they originally thought or what you might think when you see it because it really looks like a dromaeosaur. Mm -hmm. But they actually think it was a little bit closer related to birds even than just dromaeosaurs are. But it was roughly the size of Utah raptor or alternatively the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Although, of course, in prehistoric planet, it is completely feathery, fluffy, <laughs> <laughs> so like the nth degree compared to the velociraptors in Jurassic Park, like they couldn't be more different in that way. Yeah. The huge fan of tail feathers, the feathers all over its body, its arms, its face, everything. They were huddled together for warmth in one scene. Oh, yeah. With the thermal imaging. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah. Very different than the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Some ways their behavior was similar, though. Yeah, for sure. Like the pack hunting behavior. Yep. And the way they sort of like duck their head down to run faster. Mm -hmm. Then we've got Morosaurus, which is the um, the prey. <laughs> <laughs> That's our dinosaur of the day for this episode. So I'll just quickly say it, it had powerful legs. It had these slim three-toed feet. So we know it was a fast runner. And in the show, it's coated with these hair-like filaments to help with insulation. And also in the show, it's got short arms and a muscular tail and a narrow beak. And there's a whole sequence where they're on some thin ice, literally. Yep. <laughs> Running across a frozen lake. I assume that was one of the ones in Canada. Oh, because maybe. I think you get more frozen lakes in Canada than Scotland. Well, you probably get them in Scotland, too, because they have curling there and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar enough with these locations to be able to tell. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that's Canada. Well, that's Scotland. <laughs> one of the ones you named was a reservoir. So I was assuming that reservoir in Canada might have been the oh, frozen lake. That makes sense. And then last, jumping back to Hatseg Island. Or near Hatseg Island. Near it. Yes, true. They went to the Maldives to film uh, on an island and it was to film specifically Hatseg Octrix kind of doing a whole display thing. This is the Hatseg Octrix that manages to get one of the baby Tethys hadros that it caught earlier. At least I'm pretty sure it's the same one. It seemed like they were implying that, yeah. Yeah, and it brings it back to this island to show, hey, I'm capable, mate with me. Yeah, <laughs> it puts it in like a little altar looking thing Yeah, to try to, It's it reminds me of when it's like a castaway on a tiny desert island trying to spell something out, but rather than trying to like get saved. It's looking for another Hatsagopteryx on this island and it figures if any other Hatsagopteryx are flying over, they'll look at the island and mm. see like, oh, look at this. Spoilers, it works. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it was a really cool little island that they found for that scene. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just supposed to be like an unnamed tiny island near Hateg Island somewhere. Yeah. One of the many islands <laughs> that's now Europe. Yep. And in just a moment, we'll hear way more about Morosaurus, but first we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Morosaurus, which, as we mentioned, appears in the first episode of Prehistoric Planet 2. Somehow, we missed this one. It was named in 2016. Oops. We were still getting the hang of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised we missed it. Yes, but we do mention it in our book, 50 Dinosaur Tales, so we didn't totally miss it. We sort of caught up when we wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in good news, there's been some new research published since 2016 about Morosaurus. So yay, we would have probably talked about it again anyway. <laughs> so, Morosaurus is an ornithopod iguanodont that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Antarctica at James Ross Island. It looked somewhat like iguanodon, but smaller and it had longer legs. 
It's considered to be medium-sized. It's estimated to be up to 13 feet or 4 meters long. It probably was a fast runner. The type and only species is Morosaurus antarcticus. The fossils were found in 2002 by Fernando Novas, who found a partial skeleton in the Snow Hill Island Formation, the one we talked about earlier. And then it was named and described in 2016 by Sebastian Rosadia and others. The genus name means El Moro lizard, and it refers to El Moro on James Ross Island, where the fossils were found. The species name, you can probably guess, refers to Antarctica. <laughs> Antarcticus? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the holotype is part of the right hind leg and part of the foot, and it's now housed at the Museo Argentino of Ciencias Naturales. Rosadia and others wrote, quote, The Cretaceous fossil record of non-avian dinosaurs in Antarctica is strongly patchy and biased, end quote. I'm not surprised. <laughs> strongly patchy. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Apparently, the holotype was found about 30 meters or 98 feet below a theropod. Wow. Yeah. Just keep excavating, I guess. I presume it was like down a hill and not just like straight down into the earth because they probably wouldn't dig like a 30 meter hole mm. just for the heck of it. I couldn't tell in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but the fossils were found associated with plesiosaur bones and a lot of marine invertebrates. Now, in 2019, Matthew Lamana and others described more Morosaurus material, including more of the foot and associated but unidentified fragments. And they think that that foot material probably belonged to the holotype of Morosaurus based on where it was found, and that part of the foot was missing with the holotype. They also mentioned some sort of ornithopod skeleton found near where the Morosaurus holotype was found, and that could be Morosaurus, but there's no overlapping bones to compare the ornithopod skeleton doesn't have the hind limbs, so we can't know for sure. Mm. That's the one I mentioned before, the Biscovitsaurus. Morosaurus is closely related to Trinosaura, which is the only other named ornithopod found in Antarctica. I don't remember that one. We haven't really talked about that one. But Morosaurus had a stouter femur and tibia, the leg bones, compared to Trinosaura, which was more gracile. And Morosaurus was bigger than Trinosaura. In 2020... Jordi Garcia Marsa and others did histology on both Morosaurus and Trinosaurus, and they found that the holotype of Morosaurus was a sexually mature subadult. They found the growth patterns of Morosaurus and Trinosaurus to be similar to Gasparinisaura and Australian ornithopods. And they found that Morosaurus could grow fast, but it happened periodically, not continuously, and growth slowed down as it got older. Past histological studies found that Triassic and Jurassic archosaurs grew in cycles, and they grew quickly when they were young, which means this is a plesiomorphic feature or ancestral for archosauriforms, and this feature would have made it possible for dinosaurs to live in extreme environments without needing important physiological changes. Because they could sort of just hibernate or slow down in the winter. Exactly. Or whenever they needed to, if food's running low. Which, yeah, usually the winter. Yeah. <laughs> and Morosaurus is part of the group Elasmaria, which they're known for running fast. And they include dinosaurs from what is now Patagonia, Antarctica, and Australia. And that shows that all of these places had similar types of animals. Makes sense. They were all connected back then. Yeah. There's a land connection between Patagonia and Antarctica. So you've got some shared animals and plants. It also seems that dinosaurs from the James Ross Basin are similar to the dinosaurs found in southern South America. Morosaurus lived in a seasonal climate, with winters getting down to almost negative 30 degrees Celsius. Oh wow, that's cold. Yes. That's about negative 20 Fahrenheit. I figured they were pretty close, because I know, was it negative 40 it's the same? Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it explains why in prehistoric planet they had it all covered in fuzz. Yeah, yeah, they were probably protected somehow. <laughs> mm -hmm. The area could also get a lot of rainfall and there was a lot of humidity. So yeah, now we've done more resource. Just seven years, maybe late. <laughs> yeah, there's updated information. Okay, good point. And our fun fact of the day is that there are a lot of types of islands, but continental islands are the places you want to be if you want to find dinosaurs. Uh, continental islands... Now, continents? 
sometimes okay. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> so pretty much all the islands we were talking about in the prehistoric planet episode are continental islands, but there are a lot of other types of islands. The definitions vary, but I came up with two main types, continental and oceanic, I think are the two best broad categories for islands. So continental islands are simply islands on the continental shelf of a continent. So it can be the continent itself. So like Hateg Island counts as, or Hatseg Island counts as a continental island when it is an island. But so does something like Sicily, which is still currently an island. Mm. So yeah, as long as it's on the continental shelf, it's a continental island. Okay. A lot of times they're basically just pieces of the continent that get separated away from the continent by either low points in the elevation that the sea fills in, or otherwise they can be formed when continents split up and like a chunk of it gets ripped off hmm. in the process. Like the Falkland Islands are one of those that got sort of torn off from the gap in between South America and Africa. They can end up pretty far away from the continent. For example, Great Britain and Ireland are on the northwest part of the Eurasian plate, and Greenland is on the North American continental shelf, North American plate. Although it's usually considered part of Europe, I, think, I always think that's kind of funny that Greenland's <laughs> actually on the North American plate. Iceland is actually half on the North American plate and half on the Eurasian plate. It's the spread between those plates, which is causing the volcanism there. And because it's called, caused by volcanism, it's not usually considered a continental island. Also, maybe because it's on two different continental shelves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a subtype of continental island is the tidal island. These are islands that are only islands during high tide, Oh, but then they get reconnected to the continent during low tide. I don't really think about those. <laughs> yeah, they tend to be pretty small. There are some in the San Francisco Bay that you can walk out to at low tide, and it's pretty fun. We've walked to a couple of those. Hmm. There are also so-called microcontinental islands like New Zealand, which depending on who you ask is its own continent, but usually these are on their own plate and then so they consider them like a microcontinent, and then they're basically the same thing as a continental island just on a smaller tectonic plate. All of those continental islands tend to be really old because the continents formed hundreds of millions of years ago, and so you can find dinosaurs on them, and dinosaurs lived on most, if not all of them. Oceanic islands, on the other hand, form from either volcanoes or tectonic activity. So they can be formed by volcanoes or other lava growing up from the seafloor and then eventually breaking above the surface of the ocean. And that's what eventually defines it as an island rather than just a subsurface oceanic mountain. Mm -hmm. This includes Hawaii, the Galapagos, and tons of other islands in the Pacific are oceanic islands. It also includes Iceland, which is really young. It's only about 16 to 18 million years old compared to the continental islands that are around it, which are hundreds of millions of years, years old. So you won't find any non-avian dinosaurs on Iceland unless, I guess, something gets washed onto shore somehow, <laughs> some chunk of rock that didn't form with Iceland. Hawaii is even younger. Kauai is the oldest island that's currently above the surface of the ocean, and it's only about 5 million years old. Yeah, we always, when we talk about Hawaii, we think how young it is yeah. since we started this podcast. Yeah. Before that, I would have thought it was very old. Yep. I remember we were there one time, and there was a tour guide talking about, like, Hawaiian is, Hawaii is this ancient island, and it's got, you know, this deep history and everything. And it's like, well, it does for humans. Yeah. <laughs> the whole time, Samarine and I are looking at each other like, this is one of the newest places we've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> so that another type of island is an atoll. An atoll is a combination of volcanic island and a coral reef. I had no idea what an atoll was before I researched this. Oh, I only knew because actually a later episode of Prehistoric Planet films in an atoll. It does. Yeah. So atolls occur when an underwater volcanic island has a coral reef grow on top of it until it breaks through the surface, the coral reef does. Or it can also happen if a reef forms around sort of the edge of a volcano, which is out of the water, and then the volcano erodes down after the fact. So atolls basically end up as a ring of coral that surround a lagoon. The Maldives have tons of huge atolls. 
the island you talked about at the end of the first episode of Prehistoric Planet, where the Hatseg Opteryx makes its display with the Tethys Hadros baby, is on an island that's part of an atoll. Mm. And every other filming location for the episode was on a continental island, or just a straight-up continent like Canada. <laughs> yep. Like Canada is in a continent, North America. <laughs> I know what you're going for. <laughs> yeah. A relatively rare type of island is called a coral island. This is sort of a weird one, but the general formula is if you start with an atoll, if enough carbonate builds up from the coral, it can start to fill in the lagoon. And then once plants start growing on the coral, they can leave behind dirt, which can sort of build up an island. Sometimes they also get filled in with some sand. There are coral islands in the Maldives, Kiribati, Bangladesh, and India. And some of them are big enough that there are actual people living on them, whereas atolls tend to be a little bit smaller. Obviously, continental islands are the best places to find dinosaurs. Everything else is way too recent. The other problem is almost all fossils are found in sedimentary rock, and oceanic islands are almost all igneous. Although theoretically, after a long enough period of time, a coral island could turn into limestone, which is a type of sedimentary rock, so it could have some fossils. So maybe some submerged sedimentary rock from some really old... <laughs> coral islands or atolls might have some dinosaur fossils in there of some really weird stuff that evolved in isolation like the Galapagos or something. It would be really cool that if we could be. find something like that. But in general, continental islands are the way to go, especially for Mesozoic fossils. I think an interesting thing is that dinosaurs may have lived on oceanic islands, but since those islands mostly aren't around anymore, we don't have the fossils of what evolved and lived on those oceanic islands. So unless, yeah, we can find some submerged thing, we won't really know what evolved on those oceanic islands. But it's fun to think about. Mm -hmm. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be talking about dinosaurs and badlands. Including volcanoes. Yep. And, of course, more of prehistoric planet, too. And if you want even more dinosaurs, with dinosaurs in your inbox, then you can sign up for our newsletter. That's at inodino.com. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.